Good morning. Hello, how are you? Okay, and it's up. Good morning, good morning. <laughs> ready, yes. you ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. <laughs> Just getting my notes pulled up. So we got one minute. Good morning to all our audience that'll be out here on Facebook today and on the Zoom Live. We prefer to get on the Zoom Live so that we can participate better. Yeah. And um, I'm going to make you the host now so you get get started. Okay. All right. Uh, Making you the host. You're the host. <laughs> so uh, I'm, I'm going to see on Facebook and who's on the Facebook now. Okay. Yeah, maybe you can encourage them. Um, if you could drop the link in the comments and encourage them to hop over to Zoom. If there's anyone on Facebook. I'll try to do that. Right. What's that? I said, I'm, I'll say, okay, I'm going to try to do that. Drop it on uh, Facebook. Let me see how I'm going to do that. I'll try to do that. <laughs> All right, let me see. I said, I'm going to say, okay. All right, I'm on already, and uh, I'm just going to see, open it up so I can see who's on here. Just All right, I'm on already, and uh, I'm just going to see, open it up so I can see who's on here. No one yet. Okay. Well, you tell me when you want me to start. We we should no probably. One yet. Okay. Um, yeah. Well, you tell me when you want me to start. We we should probably. Okay. Yeah, yeah we'll wait until somebody get on. Okay. When y'all clean the room up. Um, I forgot to put this in uh the link, I'm gonna put the link in the, um, the groups for the Facebook, maybe people see it. Ready, yo. Did you put the link in your group? Oh, you gonna do them too? The link in my group, Facebook group? Yeah. No, I did not. I didn't think about that. Well, I put them all in the groups that I I be in. So it's in there. Let's see if somebody get on. <laughs> all right. Let me put the yeah. name on. Oh, 
Uh, Brother Thomas is on. What's that? Brother Thomas is on. We got one person on now. Okay, awesome. Is he on Facebook? Yeah, they're on Facebook. Ah, uh, a little rascal. Ah, here we go. Uh, I gotta put my mic down here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's on Facebook, and uh, we like to encourage you all. To, oh, here you go. He's coming on now. He's coming on now. There we go. Welcome. Uh, well, hopefully, uh, we're, we're at 9.04. We can wait a minute or two and see if anyone else hops on. Welcome, Brother Thomas, you and Abigail. Yeah, Miss Jackson, we are fine. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah. Good to see you again, Thomas. Yes, 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 yes. I'm also happy to see you. I miss you last week. I was on a on a journey, so I miss you. But the recorded one was there for us, so thank you. You get to watch it. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Today's gonna be good too. <laughs> yes, I'm. A, I'm. I'm. I'm really. I mean, uh, expecting. We're going to get into some nuts and bolts of things that we can actually do as parents to, uh, mm. Mm. to connect with our kids. So it's going to be good. Odila, I don't hear you. Are you muted? Muted. <laughs> I just muted because we've got a lot of background noise. <laughs> All right. You tell me when you want me to get started. We can go ahead and start if you want to. Yeah, you can start because you know I put them in the group, so people might be watching in groups. And um, and yeah, and you can start when because they, they people have to catch the recording because we want to start on time. Yeah. All right. Well, let's get started then. Today, um, we've been talking about. Um, managing, managing our children's behavior, how, how when we focus on behavior that we, we, we're focusing on the wrong thing and that, that it's a losing game because um, we come at it with that knowledge of good and evil, what we can see with our eyes and we begin managing the external behavior of our child. And, and so I, I wanna teach you how to do that in a healthy way. But before we do that, um, it's very important that we actually understand what's going on inside of the child. And we talked a little bit about that last week, but today I want to talk about, we talked about their cognitive ability, what's going on up here. But today I want to talk about their heart. So we're going to talk all about the heart today, because if you don't uh, connect with your child's heart, you know, I'm just going to be giving you tools to, uh, to be a better manager of their behavior. And I can do that. And I don't want to do that. So we want to shift our mindset from behavior focus to focusing on the inner true person of the child, because our heart is who we really are. We're not the sum of our behavior. Our actions um, do not define us. And so, uh, it, and if you, you know, just me saying that, you know, it, it, it probably brings a realization to how much we look at our children's behavior as who they are. <laughs> So today we're going, to, we're going to look at the heart because the heart is the most important thing. You know, Solomon tells us in the book of Proverbs, above all else, guard your heart. Well, how do we do that? We, we don't even know how to guard our own hearts half the time. And, and that's because as children, we weren't taught how to do that. And so we grow up and we don't know how to help our children guard their heart. But the heart is the most important thing. That's where all of our behavior comes from. It's where we make all of our decisions. So, you know, we think we make decisions up here, but ultimately our heart desire will override any logic in decision-making most of the time. So I learned that as a salesperson, you know, I've been in sales most of my life uh, since I've been a single mom. And it's very interesting what you learn in the business world that relates to parenting, because 
I realized that parenting is just a big sales job. You're trying to convince your child to buy into what you're, what you're selling, you know? And so, but it is, it's kind of the same psychology. How do you engage someone to help them believe what you believe? And the reality is that people buy things based on emotion. And so if your child, if you're not connecting with your child uh, emotionally, which is how the heart expresses itself through emotion, then you're, you're missing it. And that's a lot of what causes this, this head-to-head parenting, I call it. We want to we wanna parent heart-to-heart, not head-to-head. And most of the time we find ourselves in these head-to-head battles. It's the battle of the wills. And if you think about it, your will is not in your head. It's in your heart. Your will is based on what you believe is good for you, what you want, what you desire, all those things of the heart. And so we were actually made to live from our heart from desire. Um, You know, the Garden of Eden means pleasure, desire fulfilled. And so so that's how we're wired. Our children come into the world wired to be driven by desire. They see something, they want it, they grab it. And so, um, you know, as adults, we've learned to temper our desires and kind of tone them down. And we know what's acceptable and what's not socially acceptable. and, And, but kids don't. And so that's actually a good thing because they're not filtering what's coming out of their heart. They're like a raw human soul that just expresses and emotes freely. And so we don't ever have to guess really what's going on in our heart. And we don't want to shut that down because if you shut down your heart, you're not really living. You're not even really being your true self because your heart is the seat of your true self. It's where all your thoughts and desires and feelings and ideas and opinions and hopes and dreams and fears reside. It's it's the true you. And so if we shut that down, no wonder we feel like there's a wall between us and our children. And so we want to learn to connect with our children's heart because actually that's where true influence happens. Your child is frustrated because you're talking to his head and you're not hearing his heart. And see what happens is little children, they don't, they don't even know how to express or what's going on. They're just automatically living, you know, from what's coming from their heart. But when we shut that down, they don't know why they feel frustrated. They don't know why they feel like ignored. They don't know why they feel even rejected. Um, So then when they get to be teenagers, they're like, my parents don't understand me. Why do they say that? Because we haven't connected with the true person of who they are at the heart level. We're always dealing with them here, trying to tell them what to do, why, you know, why we want them to do it, you know, and it's all about that external behavior. And we're completely ignoring the most important thing. So the emotional state of your child is actually the most important part of his development. Okay. So uh, hold on my notes. Scroll down back up here for a minute. Um, so, so emotions are the heart expressing itself. So we have to get used to dealing with emotions. And, and historically, emotions have gotten a bad rap in the church. And, and honestly, that's, that's who do you think wants to shut down things that are important? It's the enemy of our soul because he knows how important emotions are. Emotions are our soul expressing itself. And so we can know what's going on in here in our soul if if we recognize our emotions and understand what they're trying to tell us. And so if you think about your spirit, man, being the core of your being and then your soul being around that and then your body houses all of it, then if you want to shut down the spiritual connection to God, shut down the soul. And if emotions are the language of the soul, Well, who wants to shut that language down? So we don't connect to God through our head. We connect to him through our heart, which is the mouthpiece of the soul. And I believe the gateway to the spirit because of the way we're we're put together. And so um, so it's very important that we learn to connect with our child's uh, heart through emotion. And that's what we're going to talk about today. And I'm going to teach you a very practical way uh, it's going to be life changing uh, that you can connect with your child's heart. But before we do that, I just want to talk about, you know, just some general things about the heart. So um, let's see. Uh, oh, OK. This is a really interesting uh, concept that emotional maturity or they call it emotional intelligence 
has been identified as one of the key success factors in leadership. So successful leaders, whoops, successful leaders uh, have this quality called, they call it EQ instead of IQ. It's emotional intelligence. They understand um, how to regulate their own emotions and manage them, but they also know how to connect with other people. So it's called EQ and it's called the new success gene. It's something psycho psychologists have been studying in recent years. So we think of emotions as something that's just kind of get in the way of us doing life because as Western humans, we think of life as something we got to do and not be and not connect. So but they're finding that emotional intelligence or maturity is very important in, uh, in leadership. I think Thomas keeps getting kicked off because I keep having to readmit him. So um, the other thing about uh, emotions, emotions is what how we develop relationships. And, you know, I heard someone say once that life moves at the speed of relationships. And I used to look at other people and see how it just seemed like their lives just moved along. And I, I felt kind of stuck. And when I heard that, I realized that I had not learned to connect with other people. And, uh, you know, I grew up in a household where emotions were not allowed. I mean, the only emotions that were expressed in my household was my dad's anger and frustration, which was almost constant. And so there was no affection shown in our household. And so there was no positive emotions even expressed. And so I grew up just in this very emotionally sterile and shut down environment. I remember one time my dad was storming through the house and ranting and raving about everything and anything. And I was standing there and he blew past me and I just, I was probably about eight years old and I just kind of like a sob just escaped my lips. Like I was upset. My dad's ranting and raving. I was like, you know, just trying to hold it together. And I just like, when he walked by, I just went, <laughs> and he whirled around and looked at me and he said, don't cry. And I remember that moment because it was so impactful. And I just, it was like, I just swallowed my, my sob and my emotions just stopped. And I, I really believe that that was a significant event because here is the authority figure in my life telling me not to cry, not to express what's in my heart. And so I became very emotionally shut off. And um, there were some other factors too. But as I grew as an adult, I would watch other people. I didn't even know how to relate to people. I, would, I had to learn by watching how to have relationships. And so that's an extreme example but just another, <laughs> another one of the training that the Lord took me through so that I can understand what it is that kids really need from their parents. So I, I lived all this stuff I'm telling you guys on the, on, the, on the negative side of it. So I don't want you to do those same things to your children that were done to me. I mean, I, on the outside, and you know, I've told my story, my, my childhood looked great, but at the heart level, it was terrible. So um, but it really affected my life. I mean, I've been married and divorced three times. Go figure, you know, just looking for that affirmation I didn't get from my dad, you know, choosing the wrong mates. All these things happen because we're not emotionally healthy. And so um, it's really important that we learn how to help our children develop emotionally. You know, it's really interesting that um, uh, they did some studies. Uh, it started with Russian orphanages where there were, there were a lot of orphans because of the political situation in Russia years ago. And so they put them in these orphanages and they had so many of them. They were just lined up in, in cribs and they got very little interaction from the caregivers. They got fed and they just laid in their cribs. And well, there was a very uh, high mortality rate. In other words, a lot of the infants died and they discovered that it was because that the children were not held. They didn't have human contact, human touch. And so as they began studying this out to figure out what was going on, why that was important, they discovered that human touch was just as important for survival as physical food. And so when your baby cries, please pick them up. <laughs> because what happens when you hold your baby, it releases a chemical in the brain called cortisol, which is that pleasure uh, it, it tells you that everything's okay. And so that the baby feels safe 
and that being born into the world is actually a good thing, that he has connection. So your kids are looking for connection. Um, I want to show you a quick video clip that will, uh, was another study done by, in recent years by a, a, a man named Edward Tronick, who is a, he studies child development, he has for decades. And this is going to demonstrate to you how important um, emotional connection is even for infants. So I'm going to share my screen real quick and see if I can get this, um, this video clip up for you. Oh, goodness. Share my screen. There we go. Tell me if this works. <laughs> oh, goodness. Um, oh, Zoom is asking me all sorts of strange questions. I may have to just explain it to you. Whoops. Oh, wait. I think I'm sharing. Could someone tell me if you can see my screen? We want to go to... I see your... Is that your phone? Yes. Can you see it? Yeah, I can see your screen. Is that your phone you're using? Yeah. Can you see that little baby? Yeah, we can see him. I can see a little baby. Okay, perfect. I'm going to put this video clip for you then. Baby is this. Okay, so this is a still-faced experiment. And what they did was, and you'll see, but the mother, uh, you know, interacts with the baby normally and then stop showing any expression or any emotion. And so let's let's watch this real quick. Um, it's, it's just are extremely talk. responsive to the emotions and the reactivity and the social interaction that they get from the world around them. This is something that we started studying oh, 30, 40 years ago when people didn't think that infants could engage in social interaction. Yeah. In this still face experiment, what the mother did was she sits down and she's playing with her baby who's about a year of age. And she gives a greeting to the baby. The baby gives a greeting back to her. This baby starts pointing at different places in the world and the mother's trying to engage her and play with her. They're working to coordinate their emotions and their intentions, what they want to do in the world. And that's really what the baby is used to. And then we ask the mother to not respond to the baby. The baby very quickly picks up on this. And then she uses all of her abilities to try and get the mother back. She smiles at the mother. She points because she's used to the mother looking where she points. The baby puts both hands up in front of her and says, what's happening here? She makes that screechy sound at the mother, like, come on, why aren't we doing this? Even in this two minutes when they don't get the normal reaction, they react with negative emotions. They turn away. They feel the stress of it. They actually may lose control of their posture because of the stress that they're experiencing. It's a little like the good, the bad, and the ugly. The good is that normal stuff that goes on that we all do with our kids. The bad is when something bad happens, but the infant can overcome it. After all, when you stop the still face, the mother and the baby start to play again. The ugly is when you don't give the child any chance to get back to the good. There's no reparation, and they're stuck in that really ugly situation. Okay, let's see if I can get back to you guys here. <laughs> One second. Uh, whoops. Okay, I'm back. <laughs> so 
in that experiment, you can see in just two minutes how important that emotional connection is between the baby and the mom. And if they don't have that, what he was saying was um, there's chemicals released in the brain when, when there's stress, when that baby is stressed. And if there's no rescue, if the mom doesn't come and respond, the baby begins to live in that state as normal. And so they live in this hyper vigilant, I'm all alone state. Um, and they're always in, um, it's, a, it's a stress state. And so they, they can never operate normally. Their digestion doesn't operate normally when they're in that hyper vigilant state. Um, they can't think straight. You can't make decisions well. And so kids that grow up without enough emotional connection learn to live in this um, flight, in fight or flight. You know, they're ready at any time to, you know, fight the attacker because they're on high alert all the time because there's no one there to protect them. And so it, that's why it's so important that we connect with our kids, one of the reasons. But um, I kind of relate to that because I feel like that as an adult, learning all this stuff, I can look back on my own life and see how no one was there for me emotionally as a child. And I grew up thinking I was on my own. And it's just been recently, the Lord's been teaching me, you're not alone, Amy. You aren't separated. You have, you know, that, that we're all connected, that there's help. <laughs> and so um, it can affect you all your life, the way that we as parents interact with our children when they're young. All right. So um, emotions also affect our spiritual state. So Dale Sides in his book called Mending the Cracks of the Soul states that memories become strongholds through deeply impacting emotional events. And so if you, you know, we call it a trauma, but trauma doesn't have to be something, you know, extreme. Trauma can be in your dad saying, don't cry. And, and it just shuts you down. And if you remember something, the, the, the intent, the strength of a memory is based on the strength of the emotion associated with that memory. So the reason that the, that I remember that that little two second interaction with my dad when I was eight years old is because it impacted me deeply emotionally. And so things that you remember, think about it. You don't remember what you ate for lunch yesterday because there's no emotion attached to it. But you can remember your wedding that happened 20 years ago because there's a lot of emotion or that, that, that vacation you took with your family when you were young, because it was so much fun. There was a lot of emotion. And so whether it's positive or negative emotion, that's what uh, uh, determines the strength of the memory. So if you have negative memories that uh, from a long time ago, even though they seem small and in insignificant, there's some serious things going on because of that memory. Um, and, and so what, what, we have to understand about me, uh, emotions and the, the memories attached to or the emotions attached to memories is that those things are tell those emotions are telling us that there's something about that memory, a belief attached to it, that is causing us to hold on to that memory and remember it. So it may be something like I said, it seems insignificant, but you can use that to do some self inner healing. And I didn't plan on uh, covering this today, and I don't have time. But uh, there's a very powerful method of inner healing when we, when we understand our emotion and we ask the Holy Spirit, why am I feeling that way? He'll uncover the lie because emotions come from thoughts and the thoughts become beliefs the more we think of them. And so maybe when my dad said, don't cry to me, I took on the belief that crying is bad. You know, we don't cry. Um, you know, people don't care if I'm upset, whatever. But I could, I could ask the Holy Spirit to uncover what is that lie and then uproot the lie. It's a very powerful uh, method that um, maybe I'll share in the group uh, just in general because I don't have time. I'm already way behind today. I'm looking at the time um, of self inner healing that I've used over and over and over again. And it'll literally rewrite your DNA. It's amazing. Um, so anyway, but emotions do affect our spiritual state. And uh, we already talked about, you know, it's important that we, for survival, that we have that emotional connection with other humans. Um, so when your child is upset over something, because most of the emotions that 
you know, we deal with are negative. You know, when our kids are happy and playing, everything's great. We don't have to do anything about that. But it's when they're upset or frustrated or disappointed. And those kind of things happen on a daily basis sometimes with our small children. You know, they get upset over little things like their favorite cereal is all gone. And they were expecting to have that for breakfast and they get upset. And those little things that, that seem unimportant to us and, and I don't know if my lighting is going in and out. I don't know what's causing that, but it, it, on my screen, um, I keep going light and dark. I apologize for that. I don't know what it is. This, there's nothing changing in the lighting in the room I'm in. It's something about my phone and the, and the camera on it picking up something. It can't seem to focus, I guess. Maybe if I turn it this way, try that, where it has a blank wall behind me. That might stabilize it. We'll try that. So anyway, when your child is upset about something small, it isn't small to them. And we don't want to minimalize that because these small incidences, which I'll teach you how to handle them very easily and use them to actually connect with your child's heart, are actually the beginning of them learning how to manage their own emotions, how to guard their own heart. But if we ignore the feelings or tell them they're insignificant or it doesn't matter, your cereal's not here, you can have something else, it's no big deal. And we tell them things like that. Well, we're telling them they're, that their emotions are not important, that their desires are not important. And so we're basically negating who they are because who they are wants that cereal. So it's those little things that, you know, we begin teaching them in these simple interactions that are simple for us. Once I teach you how to do this, it's very simple. But what we tend to do is we want to fix the situation to make them feel better, you know. Oh, well, I'll make you your favorite pancakes or whatever. I'll run to the store and get some or, you know, and we just, we want to control the circumstances rather than teaching our children how to deal with disappointment. Because if we, if our child thinks that everything on the outside has to be just so for him to be happy and emotionally stable, well, that's a setup for failure in life because he's going to expect the whole world to revolve around him so he can be happy. But if we teach our children to deal with disappointment, well, then they're prepared for anything. They're prepared for life because life's full of disappointment, right? We always say life isn't fair, but we don't teach our kids how to deal with that unfairness at the emotional level, the heart level. So um, I just lost my train of thought. <laughs> It'll come back. Um, anyway, so we don't want to fix a problem. We want to teach them because that's the beginning of teaching them how to guard their heart. Um, oh yeah, I know I was going to tell you. So when I was a young parent, I didn't understand this. And I was always trying to make everything just so for all my kids. I had eight kids. I was driving myself crazy, trying to give each of them what they wanted. And, you know, there was some good and good to that. Like I recognized that there, I, I didn't just brush them off. And I did recognize that their desires and their were, were important and they got the message that, that they were important through that. But I was driving myself insane and I wasn't preparing them for the disappointments of life. And I remember when I had the revelation that, oh, it, it's okay for kids to be disappointed. I just need to teach them how to be disappointed and not, you know, uh, not lose, lose it and not, not, you know, the world come to an end because you're disappointed. And so that was a great day for me when I realized that disappointment is just part of life. So, so what we have to learn about emotions is that they're not good or bad or right or wrong. They're automatic. And um, <clears throat> we don't choose our emotions. Now, as adults, we learn to manage our emotions, but children just emote. They don't, you know, it's a chemical reaction in the brain to a stimulus, an input, a situation, a thought. And so they're automatic and they are actually chemicals in our body. So to tell your child not to be upset or to get over it, is well a little um uh not helpful because those chemicals are now flooding uh through their body and they can't just get rid of them now they do dissipate quickly we'll talk about that in a minute when we get to the process but um but you don't want to just say get over it right <laughs> obviously not helpful um and ch young children don't understand emotions so remember we talked about their cognitive ability they don't understand abstract ideas. So they, they recognize concrete things, things they can see, taste, touch, feel, quantify, like, oh, this is a this is a laptop, this is a phone, you're a person. But emotions, you can't touch, 
feel, taste, measure, you know, what are they? So a young child, you know, say toddler, preschooler is feeling frustrated. He doesn't know what that is. So we have to help them just by identifying what the emotion is. That helps them a lot because they realize, oh, this is something that isn't just, you know, unexplainable. Mom knows what it is. And she called it frustration or whatever. And we'll talk more about that and why that's so helpful to your child in just a minute. So I'm gonna teach you a simple way, not only to help your child to deal with his emotions, but to connect with your child at the heart level, because that's where true influence happens. If you don't connect with your child's heart, you'll never have true influence in his life. And so, um, first of all, before I get into this, uh, it's a simple three-step process that, um, that I developed from some information that I read from different sources. And, um, uh, but I wanted to just talk about just a, a few simple ways that you can begin to honor your child's heart and to recognize him, his heart, and, um, and connect with him. So first of all, just listening to your child, because if your child's expressing his ideas, his thoughts, his opinions, his feelings, just whatever, just to listen. Um, and that just validates that, that what he has to say, his thoughts and his, his opinions are important. And just valuing those thoughts, ideas, and opinions, even if they're unrealistic or nonsensical or, or whatever, you know, our imagination expresses through our heart and imagination is the seed of genius. And if you want your child to change the world, then we want to encourage that imagination and those ideas and thoughts and kids come up with the strangest ideas, but they also come up with some amazing solutions to problems as well when we let them because they think outside the box. They don't know the rules. They haven't learned to play the games of life. And I remember when I worked in a Montessori preschool years ago and the, the, the um, director of the school was a very brilliant woman. She understood uh, a lot about how children, um, what their needs are. And so she taught, uh, I learned from her a way to get three and four year olds to solve their own problems. And it was amazing because we no longer had to be the policemen. We taught them how to solve their, their little conflicts over, you know, I had the book first or, or she put, she bumped me or she hit me or this or whatever. And so we taught them how to identify the problem and brainstorm solutions. And they would come up with the, what we thought as parents, as adults were the most like, ridiculous solutions or unfair, but to them, it made sense. And so we were teaching them problem solving at a young age and allowing them to think outside the box and find their own solutions. And they would do it and they loved it. They felt so empowered. And so, you know, that's one thing about parenting is like we, when we parent from that author, author, authoritarian, authoritarian model where, you know, you're the boss, you tell them what to do. And um, we were actually shutting down their ability to uh, make decisions and to problem solve. And so coming alongside them and, and connecting with their heart really helps them to develop their ability to solve problems and make decisions and those kind of things because we're nurturing that part of them. So just listening to him, working together to solve problems and allowing him to express his emotions are all very helpful. Um, uh, ways to connect with your child and to help him walk through uh, his own emotions to guard his heart. And so I'm going to, now I'm going to teach you this three-step process of how to guard your child's heart. So let's see, where are we? Oh, what am I doing? Not the right, not pushing the right button. So I, I, I this is how I describe what the heart is. It's the seat of your emotions, where your hopes and dreams lie, your passions and desires, your likes and dislikes, your personality and attitudes, your self-image and worldview, your conscience and your will, your opinions and your intuition, your attitudes and beliefs. It's where your destiny lies and it's where you connect with God. So <laughs> you can see why the heart is so important. The heart is the true you. Um, and if you're not living from your heart, like I said, you're not being your true self and you are the key to uh, uh, interact with your child in a way that helps them to live uh, as their true self. So what happens if you don't, if you don't connect with your child's heart, if you just, you know, forget about this teaching and you just go on with the normal status quo of uh, parenting, 
So what's going to happen is that wall between you and your child is going to grow deep, yeah. thicker every day. And you can forget about your child as a teenager having any regard for you because he feels like you have no regard for him. And so it, it will cause your child to withdraw from you. And um, also uh, children that don't have that heart connection become manipulative, fearful, and unmotivated. Um, they feel rejected and misunderstood. And they feel like, like I said earlier, that they're on their own. They got to watch out for themselves. They're isolated from everyone else. They don't trust people. They're very guarded. And they become compliant, but never obedient. So they will do what you want just to get what they want or to protect themselves. But they will never give you true obedience because obedient, true obedience is given from a heart that built on a, a relationship of trust. If you demand obedience, that's not obedience. If you coerce obedience through uh, threats of punishment or, or promises of rewards, that's not obedience either. That's just compliance. Because I can hold a gun to your head, and say, give me all your money and you'll do it. That's not obedience. You're complying with my demand for your own safety, right? So we do that all the time with our kids. And uh, what we want to do is develop that heart connection so that they will willingly cooperate with us um, rather than just uh, uh, complying in order for their own safety and, and, uh, uh, and goodwill. Uh, so if we don't connect with our children's heart, their general wellness and happiness is at stake and their self-worth and self-image is forget it. You know, they feel that rejection. I'm not important. No one listens to me. My, my desires aren't important. My thoughts and ideas aren't important. And so they, have, they, be, they end up having very low self-esteem. That was me. And, and what also is at stake is every future relationship. So psychologists tell us that um, we, we base every relationship in our life on the one that we had with our parents. So if we're not connecting and having a healthy emotional relationship with our children, it's going to sabotage every future relationship in your child's life. And the other thing is at stake is, is God-given purpose. And that's why I do everything I do, because um, our children are the hope of the world and their destiny is the key to this world's uh, survival. So God gave us each an ex a unique expression of his heart to bring to this world. And that's what our destiny actually is, is bringing to this earth what God has designed us to bring from his heart. All right, so let's see here. So the benefits of using this uh, method that I'm going to teach you is that you will grow closer every day with your child and you'll become his most trusted friend, his greatest ally, his staunchest supporter, because now he feels like somebody gets me. She understands me. He understands me. Dad knows what I, what I want. He, he understands why I, I do this or why I want this. And so um, that's what we want. You know, there's, you hear a lot of experts, uh, parenting experts say, well, you can't be a good parent and be your child's friend. I'm like, excuse me? Um, what is a friend? Someone you like, you want to be around? That you share your your deepest you know thoughts and desires with that you go to advice for advice hello if you're not your child's friend then forget it he's going to go somewhere else for all of those things and so the reason that that you know experts say that is because they're coming at it from that authoritarian i'm the boss i can't be your friend well that's a recipe for failure if you if you want to talk about true success as a parent so you might be able to get what you want, but your child's not getting what he needs in order to be successful in life with that approach to parenting. So yes, I think we should be our children's best friend and that they come to us first when they need advice, comfort, and, and everything else and that, they, that they need in life. So also when you use this method, I'm gonna teach you, here we're gonna get to it in just a minute, you're gonna gain so much influence in his life because you've gained their respect. And so he's going to, like we said, they're going to come to you. They're going to value your advice and opinions. You're also going to help them discover and fulfill their God-given purpose. So by looking past behavior and discovering their unique heart-driven desires, passions, and interests, you'll help them discover their God-given purpose. I'm sorry, I'm in the dining room today because my son was in my bedroom where I usually am, where it's quiet. So I apologize for the background noise. I hope it's not... Um, uh, I hope that's not interfering with you hearing me. So, so the heart is where everything happens. That's where we connect with God and hear his voice. And that's why Solomon urged us, above all else, guard your heart. All right? 
So if you want to connect with your child's heart, first you have to understand that the language of the heart is emotions. And now I'm not saying that you should just let your child be drama driven and everything is just so dramatic. And actually the drama will decrease when you um, use this method because an emotion that's ignored will just cry louder. In fact, that's what causes tantrums. A tantrum is just the ultimate cry for help that you that they feel like a need is not being met. And so they're acting out to try, they're screaming like, you're not hearing me, I need help. You know, um, I have a desire or a need that's not being met. And to a young child, a desire is the same thing as a need. They can't differentiate. If a child desires something to him, it's a need. He doesn't know the difference. And so if he wants a candy bar in the store and you say no and he throws a tantrum, that's because he feels like a need is not being met. So this, when you are able to connect with that emotion and help them walk through it, the emotion attached to that desire, then that diminishes the drama. The drama escalates when it's ignored because the emotion will cry louder and louder if it feels like it's not heard. Okay, so let's see here. Let me talk about that. All right, sorry, just clicking through my notes here. All right, so the three steps to connecting with your child at the heart level is it, this is something you can use in the midst of a situation where he's upset. Say he walks in the door from school and you can see that he's upset or maybe, you know, he's crying or you know, maybe he's angry and he's acting out. And, and instead of trying to shut down that emotion, which just causes it to escalate or get buried and fester, and that over time can cause, you know, mental and physical illness. So if we, if we, um, you know, shove our emotions. So we want to allow, the first step then is to allow, allow your child to express his emotions, okay? So we don't want to be afraid. Let me go ahead and share my screen so that you guys can see uh, these. Um, let's see here. If I can do that real quick. Because I think, oh, there we go. Perfect. Okay, let me pull up. I think I had it already opened so I could get to it quickly. Uh, where is it? Here it is. Perfect. So I want you to be, feel free to screenshot um, these uh, slides where we're talking about this process. So let's see here. Where's the process start? It is. Here it is. Okay, so um, you can see all three. So we're just looking at that top one, step one. So step one is to allow the emotion. You wanna allow your child to express his emotions and not be afraid of negative emotions because the reality is, like I said, emotions are a chemical state, a mixture of chemicals that are released by the brain. So different mixture based on the emotion. So, um, and what scientists tell us is that emotion will be absorbed by the body. Those chemicals will be absorbed in 90 seconds or less. So just allowing them to process that emotion, they'll calm down uh, eventually, you know, in a very short period of time. And so, um, I don't know, looking at these slides is really distractive to me. I'm not sure. Why don't y'all go ahead and screenshot that? And then I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn off the uh, screen share. And that has all three steps there. And then you can look at it while I'm um, talking about it, okay? For whatever reason, it's just, I'm not able to think while I'm looking at these right now. So I'm gonna go back to uh, not sharing my screen here. How do I do that? Uh, stop share, there we go. Okay, sorry about that. It was just for whatever reason, having that on the screen is very distracted to me. So step one is to allow the emotion, just allow them to express. Uh, don't be afraid of it. It'll dissipate quickly. And, and uh, this tells the child that, um, that you, you know, just allowing the emotion that you accept it and that he doesn't feel like he cannot share his emotion. Step two is just to identify it. Young children, like I said, Oftentimes don't even know what to call it. They don't know what it is. They just know they don't feel right. They don't feel good. Something's out of whack. 
So if we just identify the emotion, that helps them a lot. So for example, let's say your two-year-old is building a tower and the blocks fall down and they, this just keeps happening over and over and they just get super frustrated. Wah! you know. And so you can look at them and you can say something like, wow, it's frustrating when your tower keeps falling down. So what you're doing is you're identifying the emotion, you're calling it something, frustration. He goes, oh, or you can say, I see you're frustrated. And that's just a real simple statement for a very young child. You are frustrated. They're like, oh, that's what I am. I didn't know that's what it was. So what this does when you identify the emotion is, number one, it helps them. They realize that what they're feeling is something. It's not just them, that it has a name. So that means that other people experience this too. So they don't feel like there's something wrong with them. Number two, it kind of sets you up as an expert. Mom knows what this is. She just named it. And so they begin to already have a new level of respect for you because simply because you're identifying the emotion. And so then you have their attention because you've identified it. Um, so you become the expert. Um, and then you want to, you all want to do this with an empathetic uh, attitude. In other words, you really care. You want your child to feel that you're coming alongside them. Oh, honey, I see you're frustrated. And, and then you just let them kind of take that in. So you don't ever want to sound judgmental or like, oh, well, you're just frustrated. Like, just forget about it. Get over it. You're just frustrated. You can build it again. You know, all those things that I'm being extreme, but you know, the way we brush things off. Yeah. So you want to state it empathetically, but in somewhat of a objective manner. In other words, like, um, it's just normal. Like, oh, you're frustrated. Okay. And then step three, whoops, oh, there we go, is to honor that emotion. In other words, first you've allowed it, which is honoring it. Um, but you want to empathize and you want to communicate that this emotion, it has value and that there's a reason for it. And so when you honor something like honoring a coupon, that gives it value, right? When you take a coupon to the store and they, they honor it, it gives it value. So when you honor your child's uh, emotion, then you're giving it value. So, so then that's when you can say, you know, that must be so frustrating. And so what we want to do is we want to identify and connect with the emotion, but you don't want to fix the problem per se. You can fix the problem after the fact. But right now, you want to focus on the emotion. Because remember what I said, if you fix the problem and the emotion goes away, the child gets the message that, oh, well, if everything is just the way I want it to be, then I'll be happy. But we want to learn and teach him how to uh, manage that emotion and to guard their heart from the trauma that comes from when your emotions are ignored or shut down or even invalidated. So we want to validate the emotion, letting them know that it, it has value, which is the root word of, invalid, of validate, <laughs> right? So, so you just want to listen. When you say that must be so frustrating, you just listen. And the child might say, yes, it's fallen down eight times. I can't get it to stay up. And so what you're doing is you're just walking. You're just kind of taking his hand and walking through this feeling with him. Yeah, that is frustrating. And then you can offer to help um, it, it, at that point, but you wanna make sure that fixing the block tower is not the solution to his emotional state. You want him to realize that being frustrated with a block tower is just normal. I know this seems so very simple, but it is profound. And I'll share with you a story in a minute of how profound this can be. But when you say, um, oh, I'm so sorry. It's frustrating when your tower falls down. He might say something like, yes, it is. Will you help me build it again? Or do you know how to make it stand up? Do you see what's happening automatically? You've opened that door to communication. Now, because you've connected with his heart in a very simple way, he's open to you rather than you saying, would you stop? Would you put those blocks away? Just put them away. Just, just get something else and stop trying to build that. Don't you see it's not going to work? That's shutting him down. Is he going to come to you for 
assistance, help, or advice? No. So just that simple, simple uh, of uh, allowing and identifying and honoring the emotion. Simple thing. It's simple things when our kids are little. Oh, I'm so sorry we don't have your favorite cereal. That, that's disappointing. What did I do? I empathized. I identified. It's disappointing. You feel disappointment. But I didn't, you, we don't go on and explain. That's the thing you don't want to say. But the reason you shouldn't feel this way, because that's what we tend to do. We tend to try and approach emotions with, with logic. And you can't talk to the heart with the language of the head. So logic and emotion, they're going to fight each other. Think about it. Oh, I shouldn't eat that piece of pie. I shouldn't eat it, but I really want it. I'm going to eat it. I do that all the time. So because desire is always going to win over logic most of the time. So, um, so you, you want to make sure that you're empathizing and allowing and identifying the emotion, um, but you're not offering advice. See, that's the logic. Don't try to explain away emotions by giving advice. We do that all the time, right? So think about it. If you come home from work and you are so frustrated with your boss, he keeps changing what he wants you to do and you get one thing done and he says he wants it done a different way and you're just, you've had it. And you come home and you start, you know, venting to your spouse and your spouse goes, it's just work, honey, get over it. You're home now. Is that helpful? <laughs> Or you're upset about something a friend said and you're telling another friend or maybe your spouse and they go, it's no big deal, just get over it. It's no big deal. You know, don't, don't let that bother you. Well, it does bother you. And so you think about when people talk to you that way, what does it make you feel? You just get, you just, you don't, you don't share with them anymore, right? You go, well, you don't get it. You don't get it. This is a big deal, you know? So everyone responds differently. Our emotions are automatic and it's based on our experience um, our, our how we're, wired we all have different personalities and we all have different level of ability to handle stress and things like that so something that might like throw me for a loop might be nothing to somebody else so we can't judge people based on their emotional responses it's who they are we're all unique individuals so we want to honor it and by honoring it and allowing it and empathizing we actually help them to get over it and so without telling them to get over it because logic doesn't help them get over it. Empathy helps them get over it. So, um, so you wanna make sure you don't lecture, you don't give advice unless they ask for it. Um, you don't judge it as right or wrong. You just listen, okay? So I wanna share a story with you real quick about how uh, I used this uh, one day with my daughter. She was um, a junior in high school and she was in the band and she, um, and this is this method. If you, if you have teenagers and you feel like, oh my gosh, I never, I, I didn't do it right when my kids were little. Let me tell you, even adults will respond when you begin interacting with them through this method of just listening, allowing, identifying and empathizing with how they're feeling. It's amazing. It'll, it'll, you know, make your marriage stronger when you start doing that with your spouse. And so if you have teenagers, oh my gosh, this is the most powerful tool for repairing a relationship with a teenager. So, or, or adult child, even, or spouse, or a friend, you know, it, 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 it's just, we haven't, our society doesn't recognize the importance of emotions we, we haven't been taught anything about them our eq is terrible our emotional intelligence as a society as a whole and you see you see adults trying to get their needs met by demanding and threatening and and all sorts of things they haven't been taught how to just express their needs and get their needs met in healthy ways so needs are heart issues and that's why people get furious when they don't you know they're at the store and they're not getting what they want. And I want you to refund this money and whatever. I mean, you just see completely out of control adults. So this I believe is the key to uh, why they act that way. They've never been heard and they've never learned how to express because no one's listening. So we can help our kids and our society a lot by just uh, learning to do this. So the story about my daughter, she was a junior in high school 
and um, she uh, was in the band and she was actually one of the leaders of the band. So she was very connected. It was, it was a big part of her life. And, and most of her friends were in the band because it, it's all consuming when you're in a high school band and of a 5A school. And so she, um, uh, they, they had a band trip every other year. So they had one when she was a freshman and she didn't go then. And then they were having this one when she was a junior, but they wouldn't have one when she was a senior. So this would be her last chance to go on a band trip. And they were going to go to Disney World, I think it was. And we live in Texas. So it's quite a trip, you know, flying the plane and everything. And it was expensive. And so she um, she had come home and said, do you think I should do this? I have some money. And I said, well, I can help you a little bit. Your dad can help you, you know. So she we, we kind of talked it out. And she decided that she really didn't want to spend all her money to go on this band trip. And, um, you know, from a logical standpoint, she decided not to go. Now, at the heart level, she felt like it would be the last chance she had to have a, a really fun bonding experience with her friends because most of the time they were in school or in band practice. I mean, they did things on the weekends too. It, it wasn't, but that was kind of what she was thinking. This is my last chance to really bond with my senior friends who next year won't even be here at the school. And a lot of her friends were seniors. Well, she decided not to go on the trip. And uh, that was that. I didn't think much of it. I'm a very unemotional person. It's really bad, but it's because of my upbringing. I tend to think things through logically. I'm very atypical. When I learned that people buy things on emotion, I was like, what? Who does that? You know, so I wasn't thinking about the emotional aspect of it that much. So we kind of logic it through and decided. And I, you know, it was her decision ultimately, but I, I kind of agreed. Yeah, it doesn't really make sense to spend all that money to go. And so, because see, I hadn't been trained at the value of relationship as a child. So it's, it's not natural for me to think that way. It's very difficult to rewire <laughs> your, yourself as an adult. I think you all know that if you've tried to change anything about yourself. Um, so there's things that are wired in uh, when we're little. It's, it's like programming. Yeah, so very hard to change the programming. You can do it, but it takes a lot of work. So anyway, or you can ask the Holy Spirit to do it. That's, I shouldn't say it takes a lot of work. That's just the knowledge of good and evil, the effort tree. <laughs> but the Holy Spirit can't do it. But anyway, so, um, but it's not the natural way that I think or process. So, uh, so the day the trip came and I, I was unaware of it, um, you know, and uh, um, I, I go to pick up my daughter from school that day. And it was really interesting that the Lord set this up this way because my daughter had her own car. And I don't know why I picked her up that day. I, I, as I prepared this story, I was like, I don't even remember why I was picking her up. Usually she, she had her car, but for whatever reason, she wasn't driving her car that day. And so I go to pick her up and I had um, a bunch of stuff in my front seat. So she hopped in the back. And so I just kind of caught a glimpse of her, said hi real quick. And she sat down and I turned around, but something caught my eye about her facial expression. And all I said was, are you okay? And the floodgates came open and she burst out bawling. And she was a very stable, steady person. She's bawling. I mean, this is, I, I don't know that I, I'd ever seen her this upset. And she starts explaining to me that today was the day of the band trip. And the buses came to the school to pick up the kids. And they had all their luggage and their pillows and everything. And she's watching her friend get on the bus to go to the airport to go on the trip. And thinking, and she thought, what was I thinking? I should have gone. I'm just, blah. and so she starts just spilling all her thoughts that she's been carrying around all day because the buses came early in the morning to get like first thing to pick up the kids that were going. And so all day long, this has been gnawing on her and she's been thinking about it and the emotional is just getting stronger and stronger. And so when she gets in my car, it just all comes out like a floodgate. And she just starts telling me, what was I thinking? It was my last chance to go. Oh, I, you know, money's not everything. And she's just going on. And I'm just sitting there driving, like stunned thinking, oh my gosh, I helped her make this decision. Maybe I didn't help her very well. And so as she, you know, gets it all out, you know, gets it off her chest, um, she begins to calm down. I still haven't said it. I just said, oh my gosh, that must be devastating or something like that. And I'm driving and she's talking to, then she starts talking to herself. Well, you know what? It's, I already made my decision. I, 
I, it's okay. I'll see them when they get back or whatever. I can't change it now. And she starts kind of like coaching herself, you know, and I still haven't said anything. And I just said, I'm so sorry. You know, that's all I said, I think, because I'm so sorry, because I didn't know what to say. She just blah, 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 blah. So remember I said about 90 seconds, the emotions dissipate, the body absorbs the chemicals. So about a minute and a half, she's calming down. She starts talking to herself and then she was fine. She just needed someone to empathize and let her get it out. And, uh, you know, it's funny, I shared this story with another group and one of the moms said, I would have been the mom, the rescuer that wanted to fix the situation to make her feel all better. I'd have been on the phone calling the airlines, getting her a ticket to Disney World, calling the director, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> You know, you, you just, it's just, you can't, you can't do that. Life, life is just life. We make decisions and, you know, we just live with it. And it's not like, you know, we have to live with it in a bad way. It's just like life goes on. And so she had the maturity just to kind of talk herself through that. But um, sometimes it helps if you've been through a similar situation, um, especially, um, you just have to be really careful. You can share your experience as long as you use I statements. When my puppy died, it helped me to look at pictures of him and remember all the good times. Or when I didn't go on the trip and I felt left out, it helped me to remember that I could see my friends when they get back. Or I planned some time, special time with my friends when they get back. But you, you, you want to make sure that you're sharing it from an I statements rather than you. You should do this. You could do this. Well, what about that? Or what did you ever think of this? When you're using the you, it's advice and it's lectures and it's opinions. And that doesn't, nobody wants advice when they're upset. They just want empathy. So if you can share a personal experience that helps to convey empathy, then share it. But I, I just really caution parents, especially early on in this process, not to go there because it's inadvertently, it, we can easily end up giving advice, which is, is it just counterproductive to the process. It becomes, oh, now we got to get in my head. Well, my heart's still hurting. You know, you want me to figure out how to fix the problem? So we're not fixing problems here. We're simply helping our child guard his heart. How does this help your child guard his heart? Well, if you can process emotions out, instead of stuffing it all in your heart, well, then you can learn, you can allow your heart to be healthy. And then you can also learn how to, how to respond in situations so that you don't get all upset. So if you help your child learn how to deal with the loss of a puppy, then the next time he has a loss, he's got that practice and he understands how not to let the traumatic experience damage his heart. So you're learning how to manage your emotions by us walking through this process with our kids. So I'm gonna stop, I think that's all I have and see if anybody has any questions. Well, on Facebook they had, uh, they couldn't Snapchat it. Can you hear me? Oh, yes I can. They said they, they could not Snapchat because it was too small. They said, could you send the, can they get an email or something like that? What I um, I can send you, uh, or I can, I could maybe paste it to you, Odila, and you can post it in your, um, okay. underneath this, um, you can add it as a PDF. Um, I do that under the guides where you, you have your section you can add the video, plus you can add a PDF and I can send that to you as a PDF. Okay, then I'll do that. Okay, so yeah, I'll do that. But the steps are identify, allow, identify, and empathize or honor. Allow okay. Those are the steps. And um, yeah, do, do you need any more explanation on those? Please feel free to, to ask. Okay. Uh, I don't know. Anybody else on here have any questions? Those watching live. She's, um, Ms. Amy wants to know if anybody have any questions at this time. Comments. <laughs> we got a few people watching. Okay. Well, I could give a couple more examples. Um, 
give a lot of examples, you know. Um, Somebody said, great, thank you, Amy. <laughs> Thanks for having me again. Okay, you're gonna get a couple more examples here. We have All right, so let's say your child worked really hard trying out for the cheerleading squad or the basketball team or something. And they come home and they didn't make the team. Um, you know, just to say, you know, that that's really disappointing when you work that hard and you don't get what you want, you know. And and just again, just stating that emotion and letting them express. And and it's amazing when you when you do that, they usually will start talking and they'll tell you how it feels and they'll explain their thoughts or what happened. Well, the judging wasn't fair and da 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 da. And once again. You know, as parents, a lot of times we want to jump in and go, what? I'm going to call up and make sure. Where, um, where I live, there's some very wealthy school districts. People pay off the principal to get their, their child on the cheerleading squad. It happens. It's ridiculous. Instead of just teaching the child who's already in high school to deal you know, with disappointment. How are they going to get through life thinking that Everything can be bought with money. That's a horrible way to train your child. Um, maybe their best friend moves away. You know, um, I don't know. Do you, Odelia, do you have any like situations since you're raising your grandkids there that you deal with? Like, I think just not getting what they what they want a lot of times. Um, so yeah, any- well, my um, my grandson, he's autism, and I tried some of the stuff that you had already taught. And um, and I started uh, instead of him having his little tantrums, I started talking to him, and I said, you know, I would say, oh, that's okay. I said, uh, let me help you with that, or I, you know, I, I talked to him instead of saying, stop that, don't do that. <laughs> so I talked to him with a soft voice, and I and I and it seemed like he he, he just calmed right down. So when you were talking today, I said, yeah, I experienced that when I when I used it. I'm like, he calmed right down. And matter of fact, he got sleepy all of a sudden and went to sleep. <laughs> so uh, I said, I got to learn some more, though. I need to learn some more. I had my my um, my 12 year old grandson. For some reason, I don't know what I was doing differently. But uh, he was, he just opened up because usually he keeps stuff in. And he just, he sat down and talked to me. I, had to, I started talking to him more and I said, I said, what's going on with you? How you doing? So and so. I can't remember everything I said, but he just sat down and he just opened up and started sharing with me. That that was unusual. And, you know, so that, it, awesome. yeah, that was great. Yeah, awesome. Thanks for sharing that, Odelia. And I just realized I'm not using my headphones, which probably would have helped the sound. I hope, were you able to hear me okay today? Was I able to do what today? I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Hear me. Was oh yeah, audio? I heard you great. Okay, yes. good. I just realized I wasn't using my headphones. I, I forget that a lot. <laughs> it's okay. Okay, well, um, yeah, if there's nothing else, then that's all I have for today. Next week, we're going to get into, uh, I think, what everybody wants to know. Oh, I wanted to mention a couple things. So next week, I will be talking about how to create behavior and shape character and all of that very easily. And I think that's what everybody's looking forward to. He's like, how do I actually get my kids to do what I want them to do? You know, so, but I didn't want to jump right into that at first, because I want you to get the mindset, understanding your children, to have it understand you know what they need from you and to connect with their heart and now we can talk about okay how do we deal with behavior kids i'm not i'm not advocating just letting your kids go wild and do whatever they want when it comes to behavior Uh, we just don't want that to be the focus of our parenting it's all about just making them well behaved so so but we will talk about next week how to make your kids well behaved (laughs) um but tonight i have a free workshop that i'm doing uh, if anyone's interested in joining that, I can post the um, the link, and then uh, yeah, um, I can post the link in the in the group or in the chat right now. Uh, let me just go ahead, and what I'm going to be talking about, it's going to be an introduction of um, a lot of what I've already talked about, 
Here's the link. Let me copy that. And I'll put it in the chat. And then I can post that in the uh, group too. So, um, but it's, it's really an introduction to what you guys have already heard. But it's, it's, it's uh, the title of it is why traditional parenting doesn't work. And, and of course, you guys have already heard a lot of that. Um, but if you want to hop on, it's going to be jam packed hour of me just like firing um, to, to, uh, you know, to talk to some new parents that have never heard me. And also then this week, I'll be offering a three day paid workshop where we're going to, it's all about how to engage your children peacefully. So you can wait on next week and I'm going to do uh, some of that here for free. But if you want to uh, really have like an, uh, an intensive three-day workshop, it's, it's not three full days. It's just an hour each day and it'll be recorded. I do have that paid workshop this week um, for, for that. It's, it's all about how to engage your children's cooperation, basically how to get them to obey peacefully, get them to do what you want. Uh, so we'll be, I'll be doing that. So if anybody wants that, you can message me and I'll send you the link. That is a paid workshop. I'm not pushing it. I'm just offering it. Um, but next week, I will talk about how to engage cooperation and um, create the behavior you want. Uh, so, so that'll be really good, too. But I think I just pasted the link to the free workshop in the chat. Let me double check. Yeah. So tonight, if you want to join me for a, for a free workshop, you can join me through that link. That's all I got today. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Uh, Paul Brown said thanks. <laughs> and um, you, when we close out, you have to close out because I you the uh, host. <laughs> okay. Did you hear me? No, say it again. I said um, when we close out, you have to close out because I, I made you the host. Oh, okay. <laughs> that's all we got. All right, well, thank you so much, Amy. I appreciate that. And thank everybody else for being here. Thank you for all for being here. Please come back for part four and in, in the offer that Amy has given today. That's nice. Thank you. You wanna close us out, Amy? All right, see y'all.